Testing. There we go. Good morning and welcome to Grace Church. It's good to see everybody today. Uh, welcome to everybody watching online. All right, we're going to start off with a pop quiz here today. Question number one. What was Nehemiah's job? No? Nope. Somebody said it. Cup bearer. All right, one for one. I see some people getting really uncomfortable here. Question number two. How long did it take to rebuild the walls? 52, that a boy. And question number three. Who read the book of law? Ezra, there we go, three for three, fantastic. All right, today, members, will meet quickly in the fellowship hall after worship uh, to vote for the new administrative board members. We have a new October bulletin. If anybody needs it, I'm sure there's plenty of extras. In your bulletin, you will find a few things. October 23rd begins the second session of Whisper of God. Sign-up sheets are in the Welcome Center. Who took session one? Would any of you like to speak on it? Was it good? No volunteers to speak on it? All right, but that one. Teacher wasn't very good? All right. We'll give them a second chance, it sounds like. Uh, if you're interested, sign up sheets are in the Welcome Center. October 31st, uh, trick or treat night in St. Mary's for the third year, Grace. Church will be hanging out on the corner of Holly and Neal Street with hot dogs, popcorn, hot chocolate, water, and of course candy. Between now and then, please bring in a bag or two of candy. Uh, it's a busy corner and we hand out a lot. Plan to help pass out goodies or stop by if you're out and about with your kids. It looks like we do have a video to watch here this morning. decimated by Hurricane Aileen. And normally up here in the mountains of North Carolina, we don't feel the effect. A lot of damaged homes, people have lost their lives here in this community in the high country. Our community is set up for blizzards. We're not set up well for floods. And so uh, it, it's really catastrophic damages. The road that we're on here, it's uh, bridges out on the other end and our slide has got it blocked on this end. Those people, none of them can get out. There's probably, I would say, at least 50 homes or more in there. If you can help somebody, help them. Just bless him. Samaritan's Purse is responding. We're sending equipment up here and volunteers will be going out this Monday starting to help in this community. But this is not the only place we've responded to. Banner Elk, they're out of water, they're out of food. So we just delivered one load of water to them. In the next couple days, we're gonna be moving more water, more food, baby formula. We are outside Wataga Hospital to offer a oxygen service to those that have lost access to oxygen at their homes. The medical system here and also in nearby Avery County at our Linville Hospital, they've asked for help. And so as we deploy our teams to help recover from these floods and help dig out homes and cut trees back, we're also helping medically. I'm just really grateful for the partnership with Samaritan's Purse to have a little hope in our community about 12 hours after what could have been probably most, most devastating thing that we've probably seen in our lifetime. Nobody wants to live through a disaster like this, but one of the interesting things is disaster brings us together in a powerful way. So would you please pray for those gospel opportunities, bringing people together in the name of Jesus to serve and to help and to bring the gospel. And that's why our volunteers go out. They want to serve and love others, but they want to serve in the name of Jesus Christ. So if you want to get involved, go to SamaritansPurse.org and sign up. There is a basket on the table right inside the sanctuary doors, uh, beside the offering plates. This is for any additional donations you would like to make to the Hurricane Helen recovery efforts. The tithe from Grace Church in November will be combined with your monetary gifts in order to assist those who have been devastated by this disaster. Now let's prepare our hearts for worship and let's give all the glory to God.
Thank you, G. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it is um, it's pretty amazing that you watch us, you watch over us. Your eye is on every little sparrow and how much more you love us than the birds. So Father, we are blessed, we are privileged, and so we come in here today to give, give back to you, to give our praises, to give, to give you glory, to give you honor, to worship you, and, and to just give ourselves back to you for who you are, for being an amazing God who loves us all the time. So Father, we pray that as we raise our voices together, that you are glorified, it brings you joy, and Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit moves us so we know that we are in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I'll speak on behalf of Samaritan's Purse. A very, a very special organization to Bev and myself because we had an opportunity to go last year to Fort Myers to help with Hurricane Ian, Ian through Samaritan's Purse. They are a top-notch organization. They are the best, in my opinion. All you have to do, folks, if God's tugging on your heart, all you have to do is get there. They will find you a place to stay. They will give you shirts to wear for cleanup. They will launder them, and they will provide your meals for you. You just have to get there. That's the easy part. So, But it, it, it's just a, a great body to work for. They, they do it in the name of Jesus. They love in the name of Jesus. And to see the body of Christ come together it's just a, it's just an awesome sight tell them what they do at the end of at when they finish working at someone's home once they complete working at somebody's home they uh, the, the workers and of course there's chaplains that are there with them and they talk to the homeowners but once they uh, complete the project they gather together with the homeowner and they present them with a bible and this Bible is, it comes from the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. And one of the unique things I thought about the Bible was that in the back of the book are 50 questions that was asked of Billy Graham. And he wrote the answers to that and how to, where to find them in the Bible. But that's a neat thing to see, to see families. And a lot of times when people are in these disasters, one of the things that you hear what they want most, they want their family Bible. They want the Bible. They've lost it. And so it's just a great opportunity to give back, and they receive a Bible and, and, and the love of Jesus shared by the people that go down there to support them. So if, if, if God's tugging on your heart, I, I encourage you. I encourage you. So let's stand because we are made for more. Amen. I know who I am Cause I know who you are The cross of salvation Was only the star Now I am chosen Free and forgiven I have a future I was made with tending a grave. I was called by name, born and raised back to life again. I was saved before. So why would I lay there in my shame in a fountain of grace? Just running my way, I know I am yours. I was made.
what a friend.
Father, we just thank you for your mercy and we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who gives us peace and comfort and gives us wisdom. We thank you for your Son, Lord, who will never leave us or forsake us, who walks beside us. He guides us. We thank you for your unconditional love that even though we sometimes stray and we're not obedient to your word and your way, but Lord, you're still there. You're always there with open arms welcoming us back. So Holy Spirit, I invite you into this place this morning, Lord, and even now, Lord, as we were into this time of praise and worship, you have spoken to hearts already. You're dealing with people already. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit's job is to convict us of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. And Father, if you are convicting us of that this morning, Lord, and it's something that is hindering us from getting closer to you, Lord, I just ask that we just release it unto you, that we ask for your forgiveness. Because it is by the blood that Jesus shed on the cross that covers us, that forgives us of our sin, so that we can walk closer to you on a daily basis. Father, open our hearts. Open our ears to receive the message that Pastor Bev has for us this morning, Lord. She is your vessel. She is your messenger. And so, Lord, we ask a special anointing on her this morning. We ask that you just anoint each and every person here, Lord. Prepare our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. And everyone said, Amen. Thank you. Hmm. Right now. After they pray, you already pray. And the children can go back to children's church or back to nursery or McDonald's. Mason, did you know that's where they go when they go back there? They go to McDonald's. Do you want me to bring you a cheeseburger? <laughs> no. And that's where you're gone. Oh, that worship was wonderful. Um, prepared us for, we'll have Holy Communion later, and I believe it prepared us for that. Um, just beautiful. I hadn't heard that last song before, and so it's, it's hard to sing along, but I, the words were, oh, were un, uh, unbelievable. And what was that first song you were made for? more than this <laughs> I think of that when we're sitting in church on Sunday and the Lord saying you're made for more than this <laughs> this is part of it but there's a whole world out there that needs us that needs us so I got a um, most heartfelt call the other day um, you you know that Iran had um, bombed Israel and um, Iran, they had sent missiles over. They had sent missiles over. And Israel was able to um, block those missiles. And so, you know, I thought, good, you know, it's over. <laughs> um, no one was injured, no deaths. This is a good thing. But, you know, that's just the beginning. And so this is how it trickles down. Um, someone call, uh, somebody in our congregation called me and said that somebody that she works with's uncle is going to Iran. You know, we know something's coming. But more than that being a battle that's fought over there, this affects people here. And we sometimes forget that. And I was so glad that she called so that I could remember that it doesn't just affect people over there. I mean, Israel is God's chosen country and his chosen people, so we need to be praying for them. But we need to pray for our people who will be in the midst of that as well. And for those families who are seeing their loved one go. 
And so um, I, I want to pray for that, that, that uh, for this young girl who is devastated that her uncle is going to Iran and for all of those, the military that will be, be going. We need to make sure we keep them in our prayers. Pat Bayman had given me little army men to keep in my office. He said, this is how I remind people to pray for the military. And so I, I probably don't do that as much as I should. And I was just glad of the reminder. Also, Hurricane Helene, the victims and the survivors. Um, remember to keep them in your prayers. And, and I'm always willing, if like one person said to me, I want to go, I'll go with you. <laughs> because, uh, because once you do that, you just want to keep doing it. And so, you know, we start thinking, but I have, but I, but you know what? If the Lord's saying, I can help, then you go. You were made for so much more than this. Um, also, I'd like for you to pray for my sister-in-law, Jen's nephew. He, he lives out in California, um, but Jen is very close to him, and his, his mom is her sister, correct? Um, he will be having a very difficult surgery on Tuesday, October 8th. He had cancer previously and was doing well, and now it's back. And so please keep Josh in your prayers this, this week and Jen and her entire family. Continue to keep Vicki and her family in your prayers um, at the loss at, of her mom. Very sweet. Now, now Jane, who, her mom Jane is very happy. She has been waiting to go to heaven. She saw a glimpse of it a couple years ago and she couldn't wait to get there. She is doing great. But the family, of course, is going to miss her a great deal. They were a very close family. And, and um, if, if, you, if you get to know Vicki, you'll, you'll get a very clear picture of her mom because she also is giving and loving and willing to do. Um, the reason Angie isn't here is because um, Mrs. Shelby gave her COVID. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> No, I don't think they were around each other, <laughs> but she, her and her mom have COVID now and I've had it. It's, it's, this probably is a day or two after she could be out, but anyway, hi, Angie. Hi, Chris. They're watching. Everybody say hi to them. Um, she wanted to make sure it, and as most people do, make sure it isn't passed on. Nick's father, we had prayed for, father-in-law, we had prayed for him uh, during the week. He had a heart attack. Um, continue to keep him in your prayers. He is stable, but he is in, is he still in the ICU? Got out, yes. Got out of ICU. Is he in another room or did he go, he uh, came home from ICU to home. Wow. Good for him. Thank you for your prayers. <laughs> Continued healing for him as well. Um, Abby's mother-in-law, Patty, as many of you know her, she has a tumor on her neck that will, she will have a biopsy of this week. So please keep Patty in your prayers. So, Steve. Who? Myra Hughes. Myra. Uh, the boys will be Josh and Jeff Hughes. Um, oh. Okay. That lived on Indiana Avenue? Oh, okay. Okay. Mike. I got plenty of praises this week. One is uh, being part of a, such a faithful church like Grace is. Um, and the, the things that we have going on here is from Wednesday night, our couples Bible study, and the, the blessed couples that are in there. And we're, I'm learning a lot from them as well. Uh, Men's Woodworking Club um, is always a blessing. We've been on a delay, but we will bring that back in November. Um, but we had, you know, in our immature adults, our basic classroom upstairs. I was a little concerned because I wasn't in there this morning. And when I found out Bill didn't couldn't make it this morning, I knew they were unsupervised. Um, I knew Leslie was up there, so I knew that she was probably taking charge of them. But um, the reason I couldn't be there was because we had six butt kickers for prize in the back room, both our middle school and high school uh, boys and girls. And it's, we got some sharp young people. All right? the, the future of this church is just amazing. Right, with the young minds and if you if you want to plant some kids in a church that is growing and is all about what Jesus says this is the place to be and on a personal praise 
Uh, a couple of weeks ago, my niece Jenna gave birth to baby Dion at one pound, 15 ounces. He dropped down, he dropped down to one pound, six ounces. He is already over two pounds. He's in a drop down unit already and is just absolutely taking the world by storm. I mean, the nurse is just amazed by him. So there is much, much power in prayer and much to be thankful for. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Thank you, Lord, for what you are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Um, I'd ask for prayer for my friend Trenna, and she is she did have to have three stents put in. She had a 99% blockage, and so we are so thankful that she went to the hospital when she did, even though she delayed it, because we do that, um, and we're glad that she is well and, and on her way as well. So prayer, definitely. Nikki, doing good? Doing, are you back to work? Yeah. Wow. Good for you. Good for you. It was a long road that she's going to tell us about one day. Okay. She's going to tell us about. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Father, we have much to pray for this morning. We have much to thank you for this morning, and we have much to, much, just a lot to say to you this morning because um, that's why we're here, <laughs> to talk to you, to, to be at one with you, and to um, hang out with you, mind, body, and soul. And so, Father, um, first of all, we have to thank you for the many blessings we have all received. It could be, somebody could be coming from a bad week or a good week or an okay week, and we all know that we still have too many blessings to count because of you, because of who you are and because of your love for us. Because if we woke up every morning and received your grace only, your love only, and nothing else, we would have more to be thankful for than we could ever do thank you for in a day's time. Because we need that. The day would not be the same. The day would not be livable without you, Lord. So, Father, we lift up to you, Israel, for your protection. We lift up those, um, the individuals who will be fighting on Israel's behalf. And Father, we pray for the families who are watching their loved ones walk away and going into the unknown as a military personnel. Father, we ask for your blessing upon them. And like you did in the times of David, may you go before them and set the scene and have it all prepared and win the battle before they even know what's happening. This is your land. These are your people, Lord. We pray for your protection, that little, that, that big hedge of protection, that mighty force you put around them to, to um, keep them safe. And Father, we pray that very same thing over those victims and survivors of Hurricane Helene. Father, so much devastation. And, but Lord, we also know I mean, this is nothing we would ever wish on anyone. Anyone. I mean, the unknown of what, what tomorrow holds is just devastating. But we thank you, God, that in the midst of that chaos, that you are present very loud and clear. You make your presence known with the love, with the assistance, with the people who are available for people they never knew, maybe didn't even like, but they are there to help. And that comes from your love that's, that, that lives inside of us. We pray for Josh. We pray, Lord, for rest before his, he goes into surgery. It's very scary thinking about what may be coming up and may he feel your peace and your comfort. May that just wash over him as it does his family, Father. May they know that you are there, that you are walking this journey with them. We continue to ask for comfort and peace for Vicki and her entire family, for Rob, for Hank, for all of those who are mourning the loss of, of Jane. And Father, this church mourns the loss as well. Such a beautiful soul, bright spot in Grace Church. Thank you for sharing her with us. 
we pray that Angie and Chris continue to get better and that every day they are um, getting stronger. We pray for Nick's father-in-law that he continues to get healthier and get stronger as each day goes by. And Father, we pray for your healing, your um, comfort for Patty. Patty, um, Patty needs to know you're near. And we pray for her peace and comfort as she goes into the process. And then we pray for good news to come from it, Lord, for your good news. Father, we thank you for um, Jake Sutton, who gave his time and his efforts um, as the chief of police of St. Mary's. And as he goes into his retirement, Lord, we ask you to whatever lies next for what lies next for him that it is satisfying and um, meaningful work for him. We thank you for all of our police officers, our firemen, our, our EMT, our nurses, our, our hospital here, those who are always on call for us whenever we need them. Bless them and protect them. And Father, we pray for the Hughes family as they grieve the loss of their dear mother. May your arms wrap around them and may they feel your presence in a mighty way. And Lord, we pray for that throughout every day of our lives, for us to know you are there, for us to remember who you are and what you, and, and what you do. And never, never forget what Jesus did on the cross. We pray all this in his name. Amen. Good morning again. Hey, uh, we will be in the book of Second Samuel. Um, I think it's on the screen there, 16. So you're free to open your Bibles, get it on your phone, and 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 I'm asking for a little grace because there's some big hard words in this. So I'll so I'll try to uh, do, do the best I can. In Second Samuel 16, starting in verse 15. Meanwhile, Absalom and all the men of Israel came to Jerusalem, and Asasophiel was with them, and then Hushai, the archite, David's friends, went to Absalom and said to him, Long live the king, long live the king. Absalom said to Hushai, Is this the love you show your friend? Why didn't you go with your friend? Hushai said to Absalom, no, the one chosen by the Lord, by these people, and by all the men of Israel, his I will be, and I will remain with him. Furthermore, whom should I serve? Should I not serve the son, just as I served your father? So I will serve you. Absalom said to Ashesophiel, give us your advice. What should we do? Ashesophiel answered, Lie with your father's concubines, who he left to take care of the palace. Then all Israel will hear that you have made yourself a stench in your father's nostrils, and the hands of everyone with you will be strengthened. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof, and he lay with his father's concubines in the sight of all of Israel. Now in those days, the advice Asher Sophia gave was like that of the one who inquires of God. This is how both David and Absalom regarded all of Asher's advice. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the way that it leads us to how to live your li our lives that you have written this book, you have written your books in a way that it is relevant to our lives today, and we learn so much from it. So we ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to teach us today. Amen. 
I apologize to Steve. I normally send out the scripture, two things. Normally I send out the scripture several days earlier and I forgot. Secondly, I normally pick scripture that doesn't have all of those big words because I know it's not easy. They're not words we're used to. And so um, give Steve lots of grace today because he did it anyway. So um, we are in the, the series of First and Second Samuel. We're kind of towards the end of it, actually. And next week will be the very last of our series. We've been at it for several months. So we started with First Samuel, and now we're at towards the end of Second Samuel. <clears throat> last week we met Absalom, if you remember. Um, he, came, <laughs> he came up here and sat with us last Sunday, actually. And do you re- what do you remember about... Absalom. Do you remember anything about him? Throw something out about him. (laughs) He was hot. Yeah. That's the kind of thing we remember when we have it sitting right up here in front of us. (laughs) Very handsome. He was King David's son. He was a smooth talker. Did you get any dates from it a couple weeks ago, Bo? Did anybody? No, no. no. Okay. (laughs) People loved him. Um, Before that, before people loved him, and before we realized he was a smooth talker and a charmer, um, he had killed his brother, Amon. And he had killed his brother because his brother had raped his sister. Now, Amon was a half-brother, but Absalom and the sister Tamar were full brother and sister. And so the revenge for Absalom was to kill his um, half-brother Amon for raping his sister. But he came back strong, and probably a lot of that, you know, his good looks had a big part in that. Um, People just were taken to him and his charm. And um, so he kind of lifted himself up. Once he was in good graces with his father, King David, again, he provided himself with a chariot and with horses and 50 men. And he led a national conspiracy against King David. When David was told that Absalom was planning a rebellion, David, his men, his family, the Carathites, the Pelathites, and 600 Gittites fled from Jerusalem. Have you ever wondered why they fled from Jerusalem? Why Why were David and his men the ones that left? I mean... Why would he flee from a conspirator? He was the king. It was his palace. He had developed Jerusalem as the capital, the religious and the political capital. Why would he leave that instead of staying there and defending his crown? Well, he left because he didn't want, to, he didn't want the fighting to take place in Jerusalem. He didn't want it destroyed or damaged. He left in order to save Jerusalem and to save the people. So as David and his people were leaving Jerusalem, he sent um, the Ark of the Covenant back. They had, the Ark of the Covenant had traveled with the Israelites when they left Israel, and they had, tra- it had traveled with them wherever they were. But at this time, David wanted the Ark of the Covenant to go back. Jerusalem was the established place for that. Plus, he wanted Zadok and um, Abiathar, the priests, to go with it because he wanted them to um, first take care of the Ark of the Covenant, but second, to be... His, his spies, to be there, his ears and his eyes. He also sent back his trusted friend Hushai, and he sent them back to be his spies. So one of David's advisors, Ahithophel, had chosen to turn from David and place his loyalties was at, with Absalom. And when David found this out, he prayed that God would... Um, Uh, turn Ahithophel's advice into foolishness that you know because they he was a trusted advisor to David they believed he heard from the Lord he was advising them such and so now David was asking the Lord to to make chaos out of his advice so two weeks ago we left with a man we were talking about a man named Shimei who had terrorized David and his people as they were leaving Jerusalem. And he blamed David for the deaths of Saul and his family. 
And he called David a murderer, a scoundrel, a man of blood. And he shouted, the Lord has commanded the kingdom over to your son, Absalom. You have come to ruin because you are a man of blood. Well, David's men wanted to retaliate against this man, of course, but David told them to ignore him and keep moving. David said to his men, it may be that the Lord will look upon my misery <clears throat> and restore me. He will restore me to his covenant blessing instead of his curse today. As David and his men reached their destination, or as they were out completely of Jerusalem, Absalom and his men were arriving in Jerusalem. <clears throat> so today we pick up in chapter 16, 15, as Absalom's coming into the city. So Hushai, David's confidant and spy, went right to Absalom, and he pretended to be fully committed to serving him. When Absalom questioned his loyalty to David, Hushai told him that he needed to serve Absalom because he was now the Lord's chosen. He was chosen by the Lord, and he was chosen by Israel to lead the country. And can you imagine how pleased Absalom was with himself? Imagine a good-looking, smooth-talking charmer, and we can bring him back up here if you want me to. But just imagine that, that person. Um, and now he's, he's in Jerusalem. He has kicked David out. He has kicked the king out. He was loved by people. Two of David's trusted advisors were now following him. He had to have been pretty full of himself at this point. He was giddy with power, and he went to Ahithophel, one of the newly stolen advisors, and asked him what they should do next. Now, Ahithophel told him that he needed to let everybody know he was in charge. You need to make a statement that you are in charge. So what did he do? He said, you need to sleep with your father's concubines. Remember, David left 10 concubines behind to take care of the palace. We talked about this situation um, when Ishbosheth, um, Ish Saul's son, accused Abner of sleeping with his father's concubines. This isn't a personal move. This isn't, I mean, it's so very sad that the women are, this is how they were treated in those days. I mean, every, everybody has to just realize that this is wrong now but at that time it's how it it's how it was but it wasn't a personal move against them or a personal move against David it was a political move against the throne it was a very powerful and conscious move for the throne so we remember too that Nathan David's uh, the prophet that talked to Nate that talked to David that heard from God and passed the information on to David he told David that, pe that someone will sleep with his concubines in public, in daylight, just like he had done it in private with Bathsheba, another man's wife. Someone would sleep with his concubines in, in public. So a tent was placed on the palace roof. It was there that Absalom slept with David's concubines. These were the mother of some of David's children in broad daylight for all to see. A strong and bold move had been made for the throne of Israel. Well, now what? asked Absalom. He was even more filled with power. Now what do I do? And so Ahithophel told Absalom to gather 12,000 men and go to David. Go after him. Do it now while they are weak and weary from traveling. Surprise them, and the men for, with David will flee in terror. Then kill only the king and bring back all the people and bring all the people back with you. David will be dead, you will be king, and the people will be unharmed. A wise military plan of action. It seemed like a good idea to Absalom and his elders when they heard it. But remember, God was, had been, they, David had prayed to God to confuse uh, um, Ahithophel's advice. So Absalom decided he needed a second opinion. So he called for Hushai, David's confidant and spy, although he didn't know that, of course. He told Hushai that Ahithophel had advised, what he had advised and asked what he thought they should do. And Hushai told him Ahithophel's advice was not any good. 
Don't, don't listen to that. He said, instead, gather all the Israelite men, as numerous as the sand on the seashore, and you yourself lead them into battle. David and his men will be overpowered. They will all be destroyed. And folks, when ego and power are involved, the more of the enemy that can be destroyed, the more exciting it becomes. Why kill only David when we can kill David and his men? And that's what Absalom and his men decided to do. And we read in 1714, for the Lord had determined to frustrate the good advice of Ahithophel in order to bring disaster on Absalom. So Hushai told Zadok and Abiathar the priest that Absalom had decided to go. David needed to get away from the fords in the wilderness, or decide to do. David needed to get away from the fords in the wilderness, cross over the Jordan, or he and his people would be killed. The two sons of the priest passed that information on to David. And David and his people crossed over the Jordan, as they were advised to do. And back in Jerusalem, when Ahithophel realized his advice had not been taken, he knew that, that um, Absalom would be defeated. And he had just um, rebelled against the king. So he went home, got his affairs in orders, and he hung him, hanged himself. David went to Mahanaim, and Absalom crossed over the Jordan in pursuit of him. Absalom assigned a man named Emesa as the chief king of his chief commander of his army. Remember, Joab was the chief commander of David's army. Amasa is the chief commander of Absalom's army. And when David and his people arrived in Mahanaim, the surrounding areas brought to him, the people were around him were supporting him, and they brought him bedding and bowls and pottery and wheat and, and barley and flour and oats and grains and lentils and honey, and they brought sheep and cheese from, from the cow's milk. They knew David and his people were hungry, thirsty, and exhausted, and they provided for their needs. So now David had renewed strength. And he began organizing his men. He put a third of his troops in charge, uh, Joab in charge of a third of his troops, a third under Joab's brother, Abishai, and a third under Ittai the Gittite. And David said he would go with them into battle. He said, okay, we're all ready, let's go. And they said, no, you can't go. If you are killed, that would give Absalom more power, and we can't have that. You need to stay back and protect the kingdom. So as the men marched out, David told the three commanders, be gentle with my son Absalom. Be gentle with this man who is leading a rebellion against us. And as the men marched out, or David's army then went out to fight Israel. This was a domestic war. Uh, you, you can see that. It was a, like a civil war. Um, Israel, Israelites against Israelites. David's men ended up being stronger than Absalom's men, power of the Lord. Casualties are great on both sides. 20,000 men were killed. The battle was spread out over the whole countryside, and it was known that the forest destroyed more men than the sword. Then something very strange happened. Absalom was riding a mule. And then like the older Absalom with no hair that I brought up here a couple weeks ago, this Absalom had lots of hair. <laughs> lots of hair. And a branch caught him by his hair. So he's riding a mule, riding along. The branch caught him, lifted him up, and the mule kept going. So there he was hanging in the tree. Well, one of the soldiers saw him, and he kept going. But he told Joab about him. And Joab said, why didn't you kill him? He said, I'm not going to kill him. That's the king's son. He said, I'm pretty sure my life would be in danger if I had killed him. <clears throat> Joab had no problem killing Absalom. He went back and he put three javelins in his heart. Well, apparently that didn't kill him because then 10 of Joab's armor bearers surrounded Absalom and killed him. Joab sounded the trumpet and the fighting ceased. Absalom was buried as his men fled back to their homes. David received the news of the victory. He quickly asked about his son. Is Absalom safe? No, David. Absalom, your son, 
the enemy was killed. That's what stopped the fighting. That's how we won the war. And King David was shaken. He went into his room and he wept. He cried out, if only, oh, he said, oh, my son, if only you had, I had died in place of you. And this created a very unusual atmosphere. The whole army had trouble celebrating what should have been a very, um, considered a very great victory. But the king was grieving his son, so they too went into mourning. And for chapter 19, 3 says, The men stole into the city that day as men steal in who are ashamed when they flee from battle. They had done a great thing. They had won a great battle. And David's reaction made them feel ashamed of doing what they were supposed to do. They were protecting the king. They were protecting Jerusalem. And David's reactions made them feel bad. So Joab went to King David and he said this, Today you have humiliated all your men who have just saved your life and the lives of your sons and daughters and the lives of your wives and concubines. You love those who hate you and hate those who love you. You have made it clear today that the commanders and their men mean nothing to you. I see that you would be pleased if Absalom were alive today and all of us were dead. Now go out and encourage your men. I swear by the Lord that if you don't go out, not a man will be left with you by nightfall. This will be worse for you than all the calamities that have come on you from your youth till now. Well, of course, David should mourn the death of his son. Yet, in the midst of Greece, he had a whole nation to pull together. He needed to start by showing proper gratitude to his supporters and his soldiers. He needed to reassure those who had remained neutral. He needed to win back the support of those who, for whatever reason, had sided with with Absalom. And he had to do all of this while not offending one group as he pacified the other. The country was in dire need of his leadership, and David had isolated himself in grief. As brutal as Joab's speech may have seemed, it was necessary and it worked. David came out of his room and he went to his men. He commended them for their actions and they celebrated the victory. The civil war was over. David reigned as king and all was well. Not really. (laughs) The sword will never depart your house, promised the Lord. And throughout Israel, the tribes were arguing among themselves. There were three groups of people David had to bring together. He had to bring back, he had to bring his victorious army. He had to bring together the general population because they too, you know, even the men that Absalom had fighting with him because they were Israelites too. And third, he had to bring his own tribe, his tribe of Judah, together because some of them had taken the side of Absalom. The loyalty of David's own tribe had been divided. Many had been supporters of Absalom, and David was no fool. He saw the danger looking of, lurking of losing his own tribe, Judah. So as we, we're finishing up here, one action David took was to demote Joab. After all, he had killed his son. But there was more to it than that. He made Amasa his chief commander. That was the one who had been Absalom's chief commander. And by doing this, he demonstrated that he had no intention of seeking revenge on those who had followed Absalom. Judah responded responded favorably to David's actions, and you could see that David was bringing Israel back together. The last sections of chapter 19 bring back some men we've met earlier in 2 Samuel. Shimei, the one that cursed him and pelted him with stones, He pleaded with David for mercy, as you can imagine. He admitted he had sinned against him. He wanted to make it right, and David promised no harm would come to him. We read about Mephibosheth. He is the grandson of Saul and and the son of Jonathan. David thought he had turned against him. Ziba had told him he left because he wanted to get his grandfather's kingdom back, but Ziba had lied. And Mephibosheth, wanting, we found out that Mephibosheth wanted nothing more than for David to return safely and to be king again. We leave chapter 19 with the king and his people safely back in Jerusalem. 
David was clearly back on the throne. Yet the nor 10 northern tribes in Judah were still arguing among themselves because remember, God had said the sword will never depart from your house. And it was clear that David had united the nation geographically, but not morally. Their quarreling resulted in another revolt. And that's where we'll pick up next week. We'll, talk, we'll be at the end of 2 Samuel, and it is um, 20 verses, or chapters 20 through 24, and we'll finish the story of 2 Samuel. So it's, it's sometimes hard to, to transition from a story like that to um, what Jesus did on the cross. So entwined in the Old Testament and, and um, before Jesus and, and how God handled things and what he did. But, but for us, we do know what comes next. We know God's perfect plan. And it was to send his son to the cross. And so that's what we celebrate today. That's what we remember today is what Jesus did for us. And that, you know, even, even the best of us, best of you, <laughs> sin. The best of people, sin. The worst of people are no worse than the best of people because we're all sinners. We are all sinners in need of a Savior. And so we get to celebrate that today. And so... Um, as we take communion, I'd like to do something just a hint different. It's going to be intinction, but I'll be giving you the bread. I will be giving you the bread. Okay, so I want you to receive communion today. I want you to hold your hand out and receive it because this is what Jesus did for you. It is a gift for you. It is his body given to you. And then there'll be um, two people with juice. And so then you'll go to them and then go back to your seats. But let me pray first. Father, we pray for your blessing on this bread and this cup. And Father, we pray that it be the blood and the body of Jesus for us. That as we take this in, we become one with Jesus and one body under him. So, Father, we can go out and share the good news of Jesus Christ who lives in us. Thank you, God, for this perfect plan and our perfect healing. Amen. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he broke bread and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat. This is my body given for you. And after the meal, he took the cup and he filled it full. And he says to, said to his disciples, and he says to us today, this is my blood poured out for you. Take drink, and each time you do, remember me. We'll start in the back and come forward in the middle aisle. Oh, oh, oh. 
Gentile or Jew, servant or free.
trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. And now receive this blessing. Thanks for coming. Have a blessed week in the Lord. We'll see you next Sunday.